Kamer Çoba. Digi Malva, Rom, Mur, Zandit, Digi Bandel, Lek, Siyasi. Marloba, Minda, Gara, Vuxalo, Tavi, Supal, Universitet, da Professor Gior Gades, and you know, Gat Suli, Dak, Mar, Visatidis, Didi, Pativia, Kemp Vis, Tekviens, Sien, Ashe, Kofna, Eskimi, Pirveli, Vis, Itia, Sakart, Veloci, Daminda, Git Karak, Rome, Kemp Vis, Kansa, Kutrebit, Ama Gil, Belia, Radgan, Etni, Kurad, Kart, Belibar. Exhausted, no more. <laughs> I'm actually jet lagged because I arrived yeah, late last night. Uh, I arrived, but my luggage did not. Uh, but I'm very, very glad to be here in Georgia. I've wanted to come for some time. Uh, the rest of my lecture today will be in English, partially because I don't want to be arrested for slaughtering the language. Uh, and also, your English is, of course, much better than my uh, uh, Georgian. Uh, I hope that it will be more interesting for you uh, if I take questions during my presentation. There might be various points where I will stop at to ask if there are any questions. Uh, if you have something that you are just dying to ask when I haven't stopped, uh, feel free to raise your hand and I'll be glad to recognize you at that time. I think that will make it more interactive. Uh, that way hopefully you can stay awake uh, during the course of the presentation. Uh, free to DC University was very wise, I think, to have an American come here so that he could savor the fabulous experience that is Georgia. More Americans need to know about the rich history of your country. A survey that was done about a half a dozen years ago by New York Times or Wall Street Journal, unfortunately, found that 97.5% of Americans do not read the foreign news. Uh, when Americans, for example, hear the word Georgia, they think of Atlanta. Uh, uh, there's more interest uh, in Armenia in the United States, but that's limited to keeping up with the Kardashians. <laughs> On a more somber note, I'm reminded of an earlier era when a number of countries did not pay attention to problems in Europe. Specifically, the very eerie order coming from Adolf Hitler, August 22, 1939, when he said, and I quote, I've given my death units the command to exterminate men, women, and children who belong to the Polish-speaking race, without mercy, without pity. After all, who nowadays still remembers the extermination of the Armenians?" Close quote. The Third Reich paid for that arrogance, but so did later generations who were impacted by the genocidal tendencies of the Third Reich. And it's a part of the human rights is certainly a key element to the background uh, to the discussion that we're having today. The more that I learn from you on this visit, the more that I can share with my colleagues and my students who are tomorrow's leaders, and the more that we will be able to find ways to support you and to generate ties with uh, uh, the university and with Georgia. And by the way, you have to pay attention. Why is that? There will be an examination at the end of the lecture. That was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> People got a little nervous when I said that. All right, I would like to start with part A of the handout that you've all been given, uh, which is the roadmap for today's presentation with some recent history about South Ossetia, Abkhazia, and Nagorno-Karabakh. You, of course, know your own history, but I need to do a short summary because I'm doing this presentation here and also next week in Yerevan regarding Nagorno-Karabakh, which I'll refer to as NK for the remainder of the lecture. We can first reflect, I think, on Russia's rekindled interest in Georgia's two provinces, the boundary of South Ossetia and Abkhazia were drawn in the 1920s. In the 1930s, the Soviet Union ceded both provinces to the Georgian Soviet Socialist Republic. As the Soviet Union neared collapse, Georgia revoked the autonomous status uh, of those provinces, and according to the Western press, that stoked separatist, the separatist conflict that flared up in August 2008. Notice that I did not say that, but that's what was reported in the Western press. The Russia-Georgia conflict indirectly is related to another skirmish, which will be a part of today's presentation, and that is whether Kosovo's unilateral declaration of independence six months earlier, before the two Georgian provinces, uh, or before the war, 
uh, is a viable, whether Kosovo is a viable precedent for the leg legitimacy of secessions. Uh, I'll address this in more detail when I get to the International Court of Justice segment of my presentation today. Regarding the background of NK and its secession, I, I almost got a headache, a migraine headache, when I tried to filter through all of the occupations of NK. Uh, the Persians in the third century, the Mongols and Tartars in medieval times, the Ottomans more recently, the Russian Empire. In 1919, England assigned uh, NK to Azerbaijan. Uh, NK had autonomous status, uh, which was lost to the Turkish-Soviet alliance, the position of the Allies being that after World War I, Turkey would become the bulwark against communism. Fast forwarding to 1989, Armenian, uh, you have the Armenian Azerbaijan conflict, uh, and at the time uh, uh, the international community viewed uh, that NK had autonomy, but it was still within Azerbaijan. There was an agreement, of course, in 1994, ceasefire agreement, which I think could be best characterized as an agreement to agree. Uh, which said, stop the fighting, stop acting badly, and hopefully we'll be able to resolve the underlying problems uh, in the future. The Organization for Security Cooperation in Europe, Minsk Group, France, Russia, and the United States, in July 2009, had its document, which was another agreement to agree. It said that Guru Karabakh has an interim status. Uh, it should be self-governing. The parties should do everything they can do to secure the, uh, to guarantee the security of the residents or population in NK, uh, and that the buffer zones surrounding NK should be returned to Azerbaijan. Uh, NK had national elections on July 19th, which sparked additional international interest in that particular conflict. So, politically speaking, the three, provin three provincial genies, South, Osi South Ossetia, Abkhazia, and uh, NK, are not likely to be squeezed back into their geopolitical uh, bottles. Realpolitik counsels against the likelihood of NK ending up with a status any less than autonomy within Azerbaijan. Uh, as for South Ossetia and Abkhazia, they are very unlikely to be returned to Georgia, unless, of course, the West is interested in starting uh, or entering into a Cold War light. When I say light, I'm referring to light here. Power politics has frozen these conflicted areas uh, into a liberal political twilight zones with the result that they are subject to economic stagnation, military occupation, and arguably proxy wars between the larger military powers. They are, their status is unlikely to be uh, resolved during our lifetimes, or maybe it would be safer to say during my lifetime. Uh, peace in the Caucasus is incredibly important to regional stability and to global security. A third of Israeli oil comes from Azerbaijan. The U.S. is using Azerbaijan as a staging area for military operations. The Baku bike, uh, pipeline passes within 12 miles of NK. Uh, the Soviet Union, I mean Russia, if there's a difference, is anxious to retain its footprint in the Transcaucasus. Uh, for example, Russia's Caucasus uh, transportation tunnel through Ossetia and Georgia. So the key question for today's discussion is whether or not the region's political subdivisions can legitimately, have legitimately claimed uh, independence by way of unilateral secession from Georgia as to the two provinces I referred to and from either Azerbaijan or Romania depending upon which state NK is, actually, is the mother state for NK. One could ultimately conclude that none of these 2008, none of the 2008 secessions, there were three of them in that year, Kosovo, South Ossetia, and Abkhazia, that none of those are entitled to legitimacy under international law, and that NK is in the best position to qualify for legitimate secession. To develop my conclusions, I'm now going to give the world's shortest course in international law, uh, and then that will be followed by summarizing the element, the basic elements that are necessary for claiming legitimacy for a unilateral secession under international law. I'll now turn to sub B of the handout, uh, which is relevancy of international law in general, uh, and then we'll go to the specifics of the international law related to secession. Uh, international law, as I'm sure most of you know if you study international law or have practiced it, because I understand half of my audience is from the ministry, of, uh, is from the foreign ministry, 
uh, is basically the rules of the road that apply in international relations among states. Uh, I thought I would begin this portion of my presentation with a very famous quote from the late Lewis Hinken from Columbia University, who wrote a very, very well-received book, uh, How Nations Behave, in which he said, quote, almost all nations observe almost all international law almost all of the time, close quote. Uh, the public and the press, unfortunately, focus on the scoff laws, the ones who don't follow the laws when there's a major breach. There's a saying, for example, in newsrooms, if it bleeds, it leads, meaning that if it's a uh, Colorado shooting uh, in a movie theater for Batman, that that would be page one story for weeks and weeks. So the media frenzy in that kind of case uh, is the classic example of what's going to, uh, if it bleeds, it leads. Uh, now try to think of a story that you read recently where somebody did it right. And you don't often see stories like that. You usually see the stories about the bad guys and violations of international law, et cetera, et cetera. And although a lot of what we read in the press is bad, the reality is that there would be unbelievable chaos if the international community did not observe most norms of international law that we call, most of the norms that we call international law. International law, as you know, is a unique blend of politics and law, far more so than national law. Uh, international law is not as readily definable as national laws of, say, Georgia or Armenia, because unlike national laws in those countries, there is no supreme executive, legislative, or judicial branch in international law in the same way as you have it here in Georgia. The content of international law is comparatively complicated. Each state is a subject of the law that we speak of known as international law, but each state is also a primary rules maker. Now, five decades ago, to illustrate the complexity of international law and figuring out what it is today, the UN consisted of only 51 nations. Today, that number has nearly quadrupled, four times as much. More states are likely uh, and also more states are likely to develop uh, or materialize in the UN General Assembly as the various territorial conflicts are resolved. When a new nation state joins the international community of nations, I kind of think of it as a wedding. Suddenly there are two families, for example, instead of one family, and the more members that you have in the family, the greater likelihood of skirmishes, and of course none of that has ever happened in any of your families, right? One of the costs of the South Caucasus conflicts in South Ossetia, Abkhazia, and NK is that they're certainly not likely to achieve uh, or even bother asking for UN membership, absent some radical change in uh, uh, regional geopolitics. Their situation is too unstable for the UN Security Council to make the UN Charter Article 4 recommendation to become UN members. Russia would be very likely, for example, to veto Kosovo and NK uh, as members of the UN uh, for the indefinite future. The US would veto uh, any attempt to seek the admission of South Ossetia or Georgia for like reasons, or for obvious reasons. Now, one has to acknowledge that the UN Charter was not written with secessionist conflicts in mind. 2.7 of the UN Charter uh, of this organization says that the organization shall not interfere with matters that are within the domestic jurisdiction of a member state. I was just thinking this morning that recently probably became the favorite passage in UN Charter for serious President Assad, who of course doesn't want the UN to intervene in any way. The most significant limitation on the legitimacy of unilateral secession is, uh, from, a from a mother state, is the UN's bedrock principle of the territorial integrity of all member nations. While there are numerous territorial conflicts, note that there is no multilateral treaty on secession. And why is that? Well, uh, Georgia and Armenia would never attend a conference where the object or goal of the conference is to hammer out the legitimate basis for secession. That would be political suicide. Would you attend a neighborhood meeting where the objective is to decide which neighbor gets your child? On the other hand, or, or, if, or if your child was free to decide that he or she was no longer in your family, probably wouldn't want to go to a meeting like that, right? 
Now, of course, for those of you who might have teenage children at home, that might sound like a really good idea. <laughs> but states are not exactly interested in that method of resolving neighborhood disputes. When there's no applicable treaty, international law then is essentially rooted in the customary practice of states. The content of customary international law then depends upon this shifting variable known as state practice of some nearly 200 nations. So there is an ebb and a flow of the content in any one point in time of international law. So when there's no treaty, basically then you look to custom. People in the Caucasus should be familiar with the concept of a rule of thumb. Tsar Nicholas building the railroad, right? From Moscow to St. Pete's using the thumb and the ruler. So uh, uh, basically custom is a little bit like uh, the rule of thumb concept that you get from uh, uh, the Tsar is, is somewhat comparable to the idea of customary international law in international relations as a guideline or a guidepost in terms of what nations expect of each other in their international relations. A number of politicians and journalists therefore claim that international law is in the eye of the beholder. But as aptly articulated, I think best articulated by a colleague from St. John's University uh, in the United States, Professor Christopher Borgen, and I quote, if international law is all but irrelevant to international relations, as some skeptics maintain, why do states spend so much time and effort and publicity justifying their actions under international law? Saddam Hussein for example, attempted to justify Iraq's invasion of Kuwait in 1990. George W. Bush attempted to justify the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003. Vladimir Putin attempted to justify the Russian invasion of Georgia, invasion of Georgia in 2008, close quote. In my continuing whirlwind overview of relevant international law, I'd like to now move to uh, from the general to the specific, that would be sub C on your handout, which is the three paths to statehood. Uh, before I do that, I should probably pause for a moment to see if there are any questions. Other than, can I speak faster because you're probably being bored because I'm speaking so slowly. <laughs> no, I'm trying to speak, I usually speak very, 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 very fast, but I'm trying to slow down a little bit today. Because I know if I were coming to a presentation that was in Georgian, I would want the speaker to go very slow. If I happen to be going too fast, maybe you'll just raise your hand like this and let me know, okay? Seeing no hands, I will either... S yes, sir. Well, I have lots of questions, but I wanted to hold most of them for later. <clears throat> but I would like you, because the question, one of the background questions that you've raised is about um, the relevance of international law. And you, you cited a couple of kind of cases which might be regarded as examples of cynicism that Saddam Hussein offered an apparent legal justification for the invasion of Kuwait and so forth. But can you give some examples of where international law has been used in a way that was in any way effective in resolving conflicts with respect to secession or conflict about territorial boundaries and that kind of thing? tough to do in the area of secession, since the law is by no means clear, other than the bias against secession, which I'll talk about in a few moments. But if I could answer a very closely related question, if you will permit, which I think makes the point when I get the question on whether international law is relevant at all, in terms of controlling what nation states do, let me ask this question to the audience. Did anybody here drive to the school today to come to this presentation? Did you drive a car? Raise your hand. Okay. Did anybody come on a bus or some other vehicle? So just about everybody, and then, and then the ministry, of course, came in the big limousine. <laughs> All right. So when you were proceeding, did you or your driver come up to any stop signs? I don't know if you, I didn't, I don't want to see too many traffic lights, but uh, come to any stop signs where you're supposed to stop? Did your driver stop? I'm not asking whether it was a California stop where you just kind of roll through, but did your driver at least slow down and acknowledge the stop sign? Okay. What would happen if you or your driver did not slow down at that intersection? There would be chaos, right? So it's a little bit like that in international law, generally, because you would have collision after collision after collision at the various intersections where nation states have conflicts if they didn't have some general rules of road that they followed. 
to get to your specific question, uh, I don't have a specific basis for secession uh, to illustrate mm, nation states uh, uh, following international law. But uh, certainly there have been situations where in African countries they have laid down their arms based upon decisions from the International Court of Justice. Not always, not every time, but uh, uh, certain and in certain occasions. So that's one of the examples that's often used to answer that wonderful question about whether international law really works or not. I think one could argue that international law is working if one looks back to 1945 at the conclusion of the World War and realizes that the UN Charter was hammered out in San Francisco, was drafted by the Allied powers with a view toward trying to prevent World War III. And while we may have come close from time to time, there has not been a World War III. And the mere fact that all the nation states can get together uh, at the United Nations in New York or elsewhere to have their representatives sit down to try to hammer out and to try to have back, back room smoke-filled discussions is the reason why most nations observe most rules in international law most of the time. Is President Assad observing internationally recognized human rights? Of course not. Okay, we understand that. Uh, but basically, that's a scoff law. That's somebody who is doing something which is in violation of the generally accepted norms. Uh, Saddam Hussein, while he tried to mm -hmm, justify uh, his recapturing of Iraq's 19th province, Kuwait, in 1990, was also the same individual who gassed some 5,000 Kurds because a, a relative of his or somebody in his government had been killed supposedly by a Kurd, and that was the reason for using weapons of mass destruction against a large segment of the Kurd population in Iraq. So, uh, in order to be, uh, hopefully that will keep us going at least till the uh, question and answer, general question and answer session at the end. If I'll now move on, uh, uh, I'd like to move on to subsection C, which is the three paths to statehood. We're moving now from the general to the specific in terms of secession, which is at the heart of today's presentation. The subtopics within the domain of secession or statehood include suck session, S-U-C-C -C session, C session, SE session, and self determination. Suck session occurs when one state takes over another. Examples include Germany's annexation of Austria in 1939, Iraq's takeover uh, of Kuwait in 1990. It's entirely possible that Russia intends to install, if it hasn't already, puppet regimes in South Ossetia and Abkhazia. If so, there would be a paper thin line between independence and occupation that could lead to a Russian succession uh, to, to, of the two provinces and taking them uh, in, into Russia. Uh, the Caucasus Tunnel through Ossetia uh, might be one kind of important illustration. When the tanks were coming down and then slowed down, fortunately, it took them a couple days to slow down, or a few hours to slow down, but they did slow down when they got the order from the commanding general not to proceed because of the concern about what the West would do and what the U.S. would do. So uh, that's, so, so the succession flame was recently fueled uh, or fanned in August 2009 by a statement by South Ossetia's separatist leader. And he said, and I quote, we will be determining in South Ossetia how to live and how to live with, who to live with. Today we are an independent and recognized state. We will build our own state, he said, despite all economic difficulties. But I want to stress, we will be in alliance with Russia and together with Russia. The time will come one day when we will be a part of Russia. I do not plan to exclude the wish of the majority, the overwhelming majority. You must understand that 98% of South Ossetian, South Ossetian citizens are Russian Federation passport holders, and the rest of the West should report respect this fact, close quote. Regarding uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, Azerbaijan argues that although NK has been a part of Armenia in the past, as it passed through various uh, occupations, that uh, uh, there was certainly uh, a legitimate succession some time back of NK by Azerbaijan. At the end of World War I, London and Moscow uh, assigned NK to Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan in modern times has rooted its claim to NK in the concept of uti posidaitis, uh, with my apologies to the Latin scholars, I hope I pronounced that correctly, coming from ancient Roman practice, 
the International Court of Justice in 1986 in its Frontiers case uh, involving two African nations, confirmed that Uticoceditis retained its vitality even today. It provides that the internal administrative borders do not change when there's an external change in national status. Fast forwarding to the present, therefore the Republic of Azerbaijan retains the same internal borders as the Azerbaijan Soviet Socialist Republic. While Armenian separatists took control of NK in the mid-1990s, Azerbaijan, of course, still considers NK to be part of Azerbaijan. It claims that NK is the cradle of Azer Azeri uh, uh, civilization, just like Serbia still claims today that Kosovo uh, is the cradle of civilization uh, for uh, that part of the world and for Serbia. So that's second session. C session is the second of the three subtopics in our quick overview of contemporary past and statehood. Today, there are numerous separatist movements actively pursuing a provincial breakaway from some other state. NK has a modern claim to statehood that began uh, when the Soviet Union started unraveling in 1988-89. Uh, 1994, of course, there was a peace agreement uh, between the fighters in uh, NK and Azerbaijan, uh, and basically uh, that could it, that agreement I think means different things to different people, but it is nonetheless a basis for Azerbaijan claiming uh, for NK claiming that it has legitimate statehood, uh, uh, and Azerbaijan saying, well, no, no, it doesn't, it does not, because it was always a part of Azerbaijan, and I'll talk in a few moments about the reasons for. Uh, uh, for and against modern uh, uh, analysis as to legitimacy of secessions of, uh, from, of territories from other states. So in secession, uh, you have South Ossetia and Abkhazia, who unilaterally seceded from Georgia uh, as far back uh, as I understand it in 1991. Uh, they claimed independence, uh, and even more so as a result of the 2008 conflict. Kosovo seceded from Serbia six months before the Georgia-Russian conflict. I mentioned Kosovo because that's the lone, the single contemporary opportunity of the International Court of Justice. Uh, it could have brought clarity to the law of secession. I've already had a question on that. Uh, I will discuss why the International Court of Justice failed to do so uh, when I cover judicial perspectives on secession uh, at, toward the end of my presentation. Self-determination is the third path to statehood all people at least have a theoretical right to determine their geopolitical status. Self-determination, however, is not synonymous with statehood. The UN Charter, as I said earlier, doesn't contemplate or never contemplated secessionist conflicts. It was a visionary blueprint for a new world order. Its defined principle uh, of self-determination did not blossom until the 1960s. UN self-determination, uh, was then fostered on the decolonization, uh, resulted in fostering the decolonization process in Africa. But self-determination arises in a variety of contexts. Europe's gypsies, for example, have a right to self-determination because they're a distinct people uh, and they are readily definable. But unlike the separatist movement du jour, the gypsies do not intend to create their own gypsy state. Gypsies reside throughout much of Europe but their self-determination objective is pre-migration uh, at will with assistance from the various governments to where they migrate, helping them not to be attacked by the local populace. But so gypsies don't anchor their right to self-determination in the establishment of a nation state, unlike many of today's separatist movements. I'd like to now move to, unless there's a question, the next part of the handout, which is subsection D unilateral secession, a steep path to legitimacy. Of three pillars of mainstream statehood analysis, our focus is on unilateral secession from a mother state. In the early 1990s, that period yielded a splintering of statehood, if you will, toward the end of the Cold War. Uh, the USSR peacefully separated into 15 independent republics. The former Yugoslavia violently broke into about a half dozen states along the lines of prior administrative districts. For these and related reasons, the UN General Assembly, uh, the International Community of Nations, if you will, jumped to 190 nations 
the UN became a very different place than it was when it was created in 1945 with only one-fourth as many member states. If today's ubiquitous separatist groups had their way, the number of states and the size of the international community would significantly increase as they pursue their claimed right to separation from their motherlands. Familiar examples include the Kurds at the intersection of Iraq, Turkey, and Iran, Russia's Chechens, formerly the Basque separatists, uh, and the IRA in Northern Ireland, uh, Irish Republican Army in Northern Ireland. Given the separatist context within which today's presentation occurs, I want to now move to the default rules of secession. Two points. Number one, international law does not permit secession. Point number two, nor does international law prohibit secession. But there's a clear bias against secession. And that bias is usually articulated in terms of preservation of the territorial integrity of existing nation states. There are various national and international instruments that confirm the inviolability of internationally recognized borders. Starting with the birth of the UN, diplomats and jurists dogmatically maintain the right of self-determination did not include the general right of succession. So I think we can now appreciate the tension between self-determination uh, expressed in the UN Charter and various other documents like the International Covenant Civil Political Rights, the tension between self-determination and unilateral secession from a mother state. One doesn't have to look very far for external evidence of the bias against unilateral secession. In Soviet times, Article 72 of the Soviet Constitution said that only the 15 Soviet Socialist Republics had a right to secede from the Soviet Union. The right to secede did not include the political subdivisions of the various uh, Soviet Socialist Republics. Georgia legitimately declared its independence, therefore legitimately declared its independence from the Soviet Union in 1991. But South Ossetia, Abkhazia, uh, and the NK Oblast, none of those had a constitutional right to secession under local national law. So upon the demise of the Soviet Union, the European community decided to establish fresh guidelines for the recognition of new states coming in, anticipating coming from Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. And those guidelines said, and I quote, we adopt a common position a process of recognizing these new states which requires respect for the inviolability of all frontiers which can only be changed by peaceful means and by common agreement close quote even russia's contemporary six nation security alliance the shanghai cooperation organization declined to fully support russia's recognition of the independence of south ossetia and abkhazia one must conclude, therefore, that the limitations found in the internal law of the Soviet Union, regional law of the European community, Six Nations Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and the global law in the UN Charter all confirm the bedrock principle of the modern nation state system, which is the territorial integrity of every member of the international community. Mr. Lesher, I have a question. Uh, well, I wanted to ask a little bit more for more detail about the, the history of this recognition of territorial integrity, because uh, wasn't it really not the European community, uh, but which, at you know, in 1991 was was a fairly loosely uh, organized body. Georgia was not a member of the Council of Europe at that time, uh, so wasn't it the United Nations actually where a determination was made to <clears throat> admit the constituent members of the Soviet Union to the United Nations and wouldn't it also be the case that the decision at that time <clears throat> was made not to disturb the internal lines of Soviet territory uh, and that it wasn't, isn't it also the case that this was a very expedient as opposed to principled decision based on the awareness that in many of the countries which were being then admitted to the Soviet Union, to the United Nations. Um, 
there were territorial disputes which could not be examined at that point without creating a uh, you know hornet's nest conflict. So that uh, I'm asking this question because it seems to me critical to examine what is meant by internationally recognized territorial integrity. If it is the case that what's being referred to is a uh, a decision being taken at a very particular historical moment, understanding, of course, that at that moment, Russia itself was not a member of the United Nations. So that the decision to all 15 uh, entities had to be admitted by actually Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, not because they were already members. But the other constituent republics of the Soviet Union, none of them were any longer members of the United Nations, and therefore they needed to be uh, admitted en masse or there would be a terrible conflict. And I'm asking you really, isn't that history, doesn't that throw open to question the solidity of references to the territorial integrity of these states? Uh, I like to try to repeat the question, uh, and I'm not sure whether the speaker has picked up the question. I counted seven questions in there, although I think I would actually interpret them as comments because I agreed with the vast majority of what you said in your recounting of what occurred. So let me try to pick the various parts that I remember, uh, and you can help me out, out if I need to remember some more. Uh, of course, the mm, at the time of uh, the demise of the Soviet Union, you only had three constituent republics that were part of the UN, uh, that were UN members of, Belarus, uh, Russian Federation, and I forget what the other one was. So, I'm sorry? Ukraine. Okay, okay. okay. So, essentially, it, uh, while you're right that the European community had some guidelines at that convenient time to establish the territorial integrity of states, and that's basically going back to Roman law 2,000 years ago with the Uti uh, Posidaitis idea of if you, have an if you have six administrative districts in Yugoslavia, when it breaks up, there should be six countries in Yugoslavia, not eight or 10 or 12. So, uh, and you're absolutely right, it was the UN who at that time admitted the various members, uh, uh, to, new members to the UN, former Soviet Socialist Republics, uh, maybe about a dozen of them. Uh, uh, and that's because they had been not direct members, but kind of passive members, represented, I guess, by uh, uh, the Russian Federation uh, from 1945 up until 91. And of course, it's the United Nations, not the European community, that makes the Article 4 decision on recommendation from the Security Council as to whether or not to admit uh, new nations to the General Assembly. So I think one could certainly look at the decision making at that time and say that things were done on an expedient basis, which uh, I think I understand your premise, uh, which is well taken. But at least what did happen based upon ancient Roman law, which the International Court of Justice uh, re-established as or confirmed as being viable precedent that when there's a change in external uh, borders, of, if there's some kind of external change that the internal administrative districts will not change, they'll stay within the larger body. Uh, I think that's basically what happened with the admission of the 12 administrative districts, if you will, uh, by the UN uh, whenever they made, when the Security Council made the Article 4 recommendation to admit them to the UN. Uh, so are decisions like that sometimes made on an expedient basis? I think you're correct, they absolutely are, because international law is really a blend of politics and law, uh, much more so than national law, uh, and I like to tell my students uh, in any time I speak, uh, international law is probably the best course on the curriculum to realize the tremendous amount of politics that influences national laws as well, but we just don't like to say that in the United States, for example. But in any event, uh, uh, what did happen was there was admissions to the UN based upon former territorial districts, uh, or administrative districts, if you will, of the various member states that had not been UN members before, but kind of generally represented by the Russian Federation uh, uh, for 1945 through until, until 1991. Uh, and I'm not sure if there was an, I think you had another question there, but I don't know. The question was, given the expedient and not well-grounded character of this UN decision, is it not reasonable to have um, some doubts or, or 
question marks with regard to the validity of the, of the, 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 the outcome, such that when people say this is, you know, the, the, the territorial integrity is inviolable, you have to say, well, but at the time that these, these territories were admitted, everybody knew that this was a very unsettled issue. Well, there are always going to be border disputes. There's still border disputes in Kosovo today, ironically, four years after they're uh, becoming a, a, a nation state. So I've seen myself through the UN process and otherwise that there are a lot of debates about the exact precise uh, location in, in the United, of, of territories. In the United States, we have cases every year in the United States Supreme Court between two states in the United States arguing over territorial boundaries. Uh, one of the most famous ones uh, recently, maybe t eight, ten years ago, was New Jersey and New York having a dispute over whether the Statue of Liberty on Ellis Island uh, was going to be controlled by New York, was going to be controlled by New Jersey. But uh, in any event, uh, uh, what you ended up with was, uh, and, if, and, and I might add that if I were uh, a Georgian or had a lot of interest in Georgia, post-2008 conflict, I certainly would look with suspect eyes uh, any way that I could on admissions of former Soviet socialist republics to the UN. But at least that was done based upon former administrative districts uh, in general, although there are still some problems, I suspect, between various of the, those various districts, now states, members of the UN, as to precise borders of particular places. But I think in general, the concept 2,000 years old that was recently confirmed by the uh, International Court of Justice, not recently, 1986, uh, Uti Pusiditis was confirmed as a principle still having vitality today, and I think it, looking at it from that perspective, uh, uh, one could certainly argue that the decision to admit those member states to the UN uh, at that uh, time, while expeditious in some ways, as I suspect, I, you know, each, each paragraph that I'm giving you could write a book about because I have so little time to cover so much, but essentially uh, if it was done on that basis based upon the prior administrative districts and at the admission of the former Yugoslavia states, uh, with the exception of Kosovo, if those were all done based upon, uh, or arguably with Kosovo, there's some debate on that, but if those were also uh, 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 broken up, became internationally recognized nation states, those too were done on the basis of prior administrative districts. So I, for one, don't see a conflict between, from that perspective, with the uh, uh, legitimacy of the UN's determination in 91 to, or 91 and thereafter, to admit the former Soviet Socialist Republics. So that would be my answer. Maybe we can agree to disagree, but uh, in any event, that's my response. At least if you have a rule of international law confirmed by the International Court of Justice, which says uh, when there's an external change in a situation as you have with the former Russian Federation, uh, and you have a bunch of new uh, former territorial entities that want to become a part of the UN, at least from that perspective, I think we had a, one could argue that there was a, an observance of international law. I'm not sure what the um, countervailing international law precedent would be for saying that those 12 members should not have been admitted. I, for one, am of the view, and not everybody necessarily agrees, that it's better to have them at the table at the UN than to keep them out so as to limit uh, the possibility of having uh, further Cold War problems uh, continuing after 1991 or whenever they were all admitted. Let me move on and then we can come back to that question and others uh, in, the, in the free for all at the end. Uh, okay, uh, where I ended up with is that we have uh, most of the international bodies uh, uh, expressing a rule confirming the bedrock principle of the modern system of nation states uh, the, regarding the territorial integrity of every member of the international community. However, every rule does have an exception, uh, both in domestic law and international law. A basic reminder about international law is that when there's no monolateral treaty, then you resort to state practice. When we look at state practice, state practice is not exactly crystal clear, as the audience might suspect, based, if nothing else, on the questions that I've gotten thus far. State secession, and whether it's legitimate or not, is not something that is often specifically articulated by states, because they don't want to be, negate, they don't want to be involved in the political suicide of debating about whether a particular secession is lawful or not. 
There have been questionable assertions, both by Russia and by the United States, that Kosovo and South Ossetia Abkhazia were unique situations, therefore not precedent for other secessions. Uh, and so that's one example of where the law of secession, uh, I don't think, is crystal clear. Uh, in that type of situation where you don't have a treaty, it's not clear what state practice is, then the International Court of Justice statute, which the international law students here may have studied, Article 38 says that you can look to the decisions of national and international courts to get guidance on what the content is of international law. The leading case uh, uh, on unilateral secession is Canada's 1998 Quebec secession case. That came in the aftermath of the 1995 national referendum on the potential secession of Quebec from uh, French-speaking Quebec from Canada. The Canadian Supreme Court, three years later, authoritatively traced the evolution of the law of unilateral secession in the event that Quebec, might, who was unsuccessful at the polls, might one uh, day decide to declare uh, its secession in Canada. The court outlined the extraordinary circumstances whereby if you have a grievous human rights situation, that can give rise to the international recognition of the legitimacy of a unilateral secession from a mother state. This exception to national sovereignty, sometimes referred to as remedial secession in the, in the writings, academic writings, is premised upon three commonly accepted elements. And this is really at the heart of today's lecture. Uh, that's why I've outlined those three elements on your handout uh, under Part D. Number one, there must be a distinct people who is claiming secession. You can't have a group of Texans, for example, say, well, we're Texas and we're better than everybody else, the other 49 states, so we want to secede. Okay? That's not going to exactly work. Secondly, there has to be not just human rights violations, but gross human rights violations. Genocide, etc., etc. Uh, number three, there must be, and this is the one that's the toughest to meet or to match with the facts, is there is no alternative but secession. Let's address each of the elements briefly in turn. Number one, there must be a people. The meaning of even this first element is by no means uniform. Uh, a good example of a people, uh, one of the best that I've found uh, in my research, is Finland's secession from Russia in 1917. The Finnish people, uh, their ancestors immigrated from the Urals to Finland some 2,000 years before. Uh, the Finnish people later evolved as there were uh, waves of immigration, northeast, south, and west. Uh, Finland, uh, as you know, was a part of the Kingdom of Sweden until 1809 when it was ceded to the Russian Empire. But the Finnish people did not lose their distinct character or language. In 1917, when the Bolsheviks, declar the Bolsheviks declared then that there was a general right of self-determination, uh, uh, and that right included complete secession of the peoples of Russia, on the same day the Finnish parliament jumped on that opportunity, issued a declaration conveniently assuming that Finland could officially declare its own sovereignty and statehood. Now, if there were Russians in the audience, they might have a question about whether that was a legitimate secession or not. But nonetheless, that at least is an example of the people element, uh, uh, a group that says that it is a people. Uh, ethnic Georgians in South uh, Ossetia and Abkhazia have always been a significant percentage of the local population. Uh, in 1991, when the two provinces uh, claimed their independence from Georgia, the Western press said that the separatists uprooted many ethnic Georgians from their homes. Now, I'm told by local sources here in Tbilisi that uh, ethnic Russians uh, account for only 1%, even as of, of the population, in both provinces as of 2008. I'm also told that the presence of an ethnic Russian minority uh, in South Ossetia and Abkhazia has never been an issue, never uh, was, never has, never will be a, a problem for Georgia or Georgians. But regarding the events leading to the Georgia-Russia uh, conflict of August 2008, the Western press did report as follows, that there was ethnic cleansing in South Ossetia and Abkhazia, which forced ethnic Georgians into other parts of Georgia. In other words, I have been told there's been no ethnic cleansing in South Ossetia or Abkhazia, but at least the Western press reports that there were some serious problems in terms of the human rights of ethnic Georgians being affected in those two areas. We know, of course, that in 2003, Russia issued its edict saying that it would protect 
ethnic Russians in all former Soviet Socialist Republics. One way, one way Russia chose to do that was to issue Russian passports to ethnic Russians in South Ossetia and Abkhazia. And I'm not sure if that, those passports went to all comers, uh, but certainly to ethnic uh, uh, Russians. To everybody. To everybody, okay. Right. Yeah, so probably they would be delighted to have an ethnic Georgian saying, yes, I want to be Russian. The objective, uh, an objective basis for uh, arguing that Russia was behind these separatist movements uh, is demonstrated by the quantity and quality of captured military weapons in the 2008 conflict that were weapons that were not available from Georgian military sources. Uh, as to Abkhazia, the Western press reported that ethnic Georgians were being displaced from these Georgian provinces, uh, that the number of Georgians in Abkhazia that were displaced, uh, ethnic cleansing, ranged from 200,000 to 250,000. And since Georgia has a population of a little over 4 million, a uh, quarter million people is no small percentage. The numbers in, from South Ossetia uh, were not as concrete, but according to the Western press, on a comparative basis, comparatively, the percentage of ethnic Russian population grew, in a sense, in both provinces, if for no other reason than the, the, it remained relatively constant. In other words, lots of Russians didn't flock into those areas, but ethnic Georgians fled to other parts of Georgia proper because of what was being done by the Russians. Shifting to Nagorno-Karabakh, Armenians are 70, now 75% of the population. I understand the other 25% are in Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> Armenians would not be, are not a distinct people if uh, NK is in Armenia. Uh, but of course, if Armenians are, if, Arme if NK is a part of Azerbaijan, then they would be a distinct people. The current position of Armenia in its capacity as one of the founding members of the post-Soviet community of independent states, the kind of replacement organization for USSR, is that all members of CIS must respect current international borders. Thus, Armenia is bound not to change an international border by force and not to act in a way which would be, uh, which would conflict with the general idea of uh, uh, maintenance of internationally recognized bo uh, international borders. So one reason that Armenia is not recognizing, so this is one reason why Armenia is not recognizing NK's independence, although Armenia is certainly hoping the rest of the international community will do that. Uh, I believe that a president of Armenia was shot because he allegedly failed to support NK and its uh, independence, uh, uh, but that was because Armenia is in this unusual position of you have a lot of Armenians over in NK, which is geographically inside of Azerbaijan, but Armenia cannot act in a way uh, as to foment any kind of a conflict and has to be very, very cautious. And that's one of the reasons why, because I was curious before coming here and doing research for my talk, why in the world Armenia wouldn't recognize uh, Nagorno-Karabakh as an independent state? So this is why, because of Armenia's position as a founding member of CIS. Element number two on your handout is there must be, in addition to a people, distinct people, gross human rights violations. Unilateral secession will be supported by the international community when acts by either a majority population and or government renders a minority unable to develop its identity within the framework of the existing state. Remedial secession is an equitable remedy designed to ameliorate the harshness of the bias against secession whenever there's been a gross human rights violation. South Ossetia, Abkhazia, uh, according to the Western press, South Ossetians fled to North, Oss North Ossetia in 1992 and 04 when Georgian military actions were launched there. I don't say this, this is what the Western press says. <laughs> the Western press also reported that Georgia was very, very concerned about uh, the decreasing number of ethnic Georgians in South Ossetia and Abkhazia because of various actions being taken by the Russian military uh, and possibly separatist leaders. Enter the international organizations. The UN established an observer mission in Georgia in the mid-90s. Russia, unfortunately, brought that to an end related to the Georgia-Russia conflict. The UN mission in Georgia was later entrusted to overseeing the 1994 ceasefire accord uh, between Georgian government and Abkhaz separatists. 
The UN had no jurisdiction in nearby South, South, South Ossetia. The European Union monitoring mission in Georgia reacted to the 2008 presence of the Russian military in Georgia by extending its mission through September 2010 in the following terms, and I quote, the Council reiterated its firm support for the security and stability of Georgia based on full respect for the principles of independence, sovereignty, and territorial integrity recognized by international law, close quote. All right, so we have a sense of what has occurred during these two conflicts uh, here in Georgia and also in Armenia or Azerbaijan, depending upon your point of view, with NK. A couple of related points that could come up since we're having a general human rights discussion. What about humanitarian intervention? Could Russia, in other words, have claimed that it had a right to enter the disputed areas, South Ossetia and Abkhazia, for the expect for the expressed purpose of protecting the human rights of the local ethnic Russians. Well, there's a problem with that. International law frowns upon single nation interventions in the name of humanitarian interventions. Might look good on, on paper as a legal basis, but the reality is, is that it stinks whenever it's something done by one nation rather than an international organization of states. The UN has a 2005 Human Rights Initiative, which I'm sure you studied, for those of you who have taken an international law course, responsibility to protect. Its goal is to protect internationally protected human rights for the peoples of the world. But nevertheless, that did not change uh, or did not suggest uh, uh, that humanitarian intervention is acceptable when it's done by one country. Put another way, it's not hard to predict how residents of Tbilisi or Yerevan would feel if the Russian military suddenly appeared in your streets, alleging its right to protect local ethnic Russians. Now, what about genocide as a basis for establishing gross human rights violations, okay? And therefore, uh, a unilateral secession. Russia claimed genocide by Georgia uh, in South Ossetia and Abkhazia, but that's pretty hard to prove. Russia claimed that it was necessary to intervene because of the genocidal tendencies of the Soviet government allegedly uh, perpetrated against ethnic Russians. Georgia, as you well know, similarly accused Russia of genocide in the 2008 International Court of Justice case, which I'll discuss a little later in the context of judicial pronouncements on human rights in Georgia uh, related to the conflict. As to Armenia, that there was a genocide in Armenia at the time of World War I is beyond doubt. One need only review the U.S. Embassy uh, Tur uh, in Turkey, uh, cables to the United States Department, U.S. State Department, uh, as objective evidence of the atrocities that then occurred. But genocide is not likely a factor in the recent South Caucasus secessions. Now, why is that? Well, the actual perpetration of genocide, which is, of course, the supreme violation of human rights, uh, uh, under Article 8, of the Genocide Convention, the 1948 post-World War II document that contains the basic convention, imposes at least a theoretical obligation on the international community not to, you know, not to do something to intervene to prevent the genocide from occurring. Unfortunately, too many politicians, too many journalists, uh, don't understand the proper application of this supreme international crime, genocide, that is an inconvenient truth for them, so they report without regard to the requirements for genocide. The International Court of Justice made this clear in its 2007 Bosnia versus Serbia litigation. Bosnia had accused Serbia of genocide in 1995 at the Srebrenica massacre. 7,800 Muslim men and boys, all of military age, slaughtered in roughly a three-day period at the first ever UN safe haven in Srebrenica. The safe has played its role as well. Uh, for a variety of reasons. So, um, uh, the United States, in my view, this is my personal view, not necessarily that of anybody in my country, up anybody else, we took, as I said before, a bad situation here in Georgia and made it worse. Uh, uh, and, that, and basically what we did was we announced uh, whenever it looked like the conflict was flaring up that we were going to support uh, entrance of Ukraine and Georgia into NATO. Uh, and the reason that I'm concerned about that is you all remember, of course, 
You all remember, of course, the very famous statement by President Reagan when he was standing at the Berlin Wall and said, Mr. Gorbachev, throw this wall down. At that time, Secretary of State Baker said the following, which is paraphrasing, if that happens, and if the Warsaw Pact goes along and so the Soviet Union meet their demise, NATO will not move one inch east of Berlin. Last time I looked on a map, Georgia is not within an inch of Berlin, a little bit further east. So with all of the things that have been happening, the missile shield, for example, then uh, it's just one example, I can see why Russia is terribly concerned about the United States. Uh, I mean, you know, the Russian, the missiles, missile shield debate, which started with Reagan actually, is something that, uh, is something that could continue to stoke Cold War light, as I call it, where we haven't quite gotten to the point where there's gonna be a Cold War too, but there are things kind of in the background that are little dots that could be connected, you know, like the Georgian conflict, that, uh, which is arguably a, con a, a proxy war between the United States and Russia. So when you have major countries, the leading power in the world, the US military power, Russia, uh, doing their part to mm, effectively participate in the uh, uh, in making taking a bad situation, making it worse. That's kind of going contra to what underlies your great question, which is what can be done. And the only thing that I can recommend at this time is for hopefully more people to realize what the law of international. You know, of course, I have a, a, a very my view is, is one that, uh, for many academics, is something that hopefully will show up somewhere tomorrow if enough of us are giving lectures of this kind in various countries, because that's the real reason for this lecture, is to answer your question. So the more that we understand what secession is, what the rules are, and what the exceptions are, and essentially how to come up with a state practice that clearly says whether the secession is, uh, is uh, uh, legitimate or not, the more that we move in that direction, the closer we'll get to try resolving the conflicts and the uh, unusual, horrible gross human rights associated with these uh, various secessions. Uh, I'm reminded, I was going to talk about this later, but I guess I could refer to it at this point. Look at the bizarre discussion between Secretary of State Condi Rice uh, and I have his name later, Sergei Leverov, I think is his name for Russia. Yeah, he's foreign minister of yeah, yeah, so she says Kosovo is not, it's unique. There's never been anything like it before in the world. It's absolutely unique uh, because of the, she says because of the way that Yugoslavia broke up. You know, in that sense, they're all unique. So she's saying, therefore, six months later when South Ossetia and Abkhazia secede from Georgia, that Kosovo is certainly not a, a precedent for that. Well, what Russia is doing is saying effectively is, uh, or what uh, uh, Condi Rice is doing for the US is effectively saying uh, in Kosovo, and as for uh, uh, Russia as to, so they're, they're saying these are unique and therefore there is no progressive development of international law that can be formed based upon uh, 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 determining between the two countries, Russia and the US, when is a legitimate, when is a secession legitimate? One of the reasons they don't want to do that, as I said before, is that's political suicide. To engage in a conversation which would intelligently exactly. answer your question because they don't want to, as I said before, go to a neighborhood meeting talking about who's going to get your kid or whether your kid is going to belong to somebody else at the end of the day. I would like now to move to my final, no, actually next to last portion, uh, which is international and judicial perspectives. There are two cases that could have been very helpful to the gross human rights violations element of remedial secession, uh, which unfortunately were not, and my goal is to very, very briefly identify uh, the cases and, what, and primarily to point out uh, the failures uh, of those cases to take an opportunity to uh, develop uh, uh, this particular se um, segment of the three-part segment to uh, uh, legitimacy of international se successions. The first is, I begin with the Georgia-Russia case for the International Court of Justice. There were two proceedings in this litigation. Uh, uh, in, I have to be very, very careful about my facts today because we have a representative of Georgia president, present in the audience today who was very much, in, a former, who was very much involved in uh, the proceedings. Uh, the first Georgia, uh, the first was Georgia's application for a provisional remedy in 2008. In other words, you go to the court and you say, hey, 
we have a conflict here. Will you issue an order uh, which will uh, do something to control the conflict? You mean International Court of Justice? Yeah, International Court of yeah. Justice, because I'm yeah. not talking about the two yeah. International yeah. Court of Justice cases where you look for, well, how do we resolve it? If we can't resolve it between states, uh, 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 you know, Russia and the U.S. doing their thing behind the scene, maybe Georgia can go to the International Court of Justice knowing that and try to see if it can get uh, the World Court of a Public Opinion behind it by way of a successful result in the Georgian litigation, Georgia-Russian litigation. Mindful of the February 2007 Bosnia-Serbia International Court of Justice decision, Georgia sued Russia in the International Court in August 2008. I think it was on the 12th, which was like a couple of the day after the conflict ended. It was right around that time, time of the conflict. Georgia's pleadings asserted that Russia had violated both the Genocide Convention and also the Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discriminations, or CERD, C-E-R-D. I'm hoping you'll allow me to refer to CERD as a shorthand, otherwise this, this presentation will be two hours longer. So that's Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, or C-E-R-D, CERD. In this first round, the ICJ found in favor of Georgia. Georgia pled enough to trigger the prima facie claim, uh, Georgia's prima facie claims against Russia. But as all students of international law know, that when you get, you seek provisional re relief in your pleadings and then you get it from the court, that's limited in scope. The parties are ordered to maintain the status quo. You know, the court says, Georgia, Russia, stop behaving badly. Uh, and the court then needs time to get the various briefs from the parties, to get the amicus, to get the briefs and memorials from all the other parties who care to express an interest. I'm not sure how many uh, Friends of the Court briefs were filed, but there were probably... None. Pardon? None. None, okay. So it looked like this is a situation where the decision was made by the international community not to back Georgia in its application, although Georgia was successful in the first of two steps by getting this provisional order from the court which is, that makes sense, the court says, hey, stop fighting, freeze the conflict, hold off until we, the court, can decide uh, the issues presented in the case, uh, which were in this instance, whether Russia violated a genocide convention in the Syria. A successful application for provisional relief is by no means a predetermination of the merits uh, that will occur at the time of trial and final judgment. In the second of the two events, in this Georgia versus Russia case. You have the final judgment from the International Court. The court's 2011 judgment is of surprising little value, based on my read, uh, for purposes of human rights secession analysis. Why is that? And remember, the context is whether Russia had violated the genocide conventions and the CERB. This is the type of case that could have been very helpful in overall human rights analysis when you have two major countries, Georgia and Russia, appearing before the highest court, the International Court of Justice, for purposes of resolving major human rights issues presented in both of those treaties. However, the International Court of Justice found that Russia, excuse me, Georgia had not provided sufficient evidence of Russian conduct in South Ossetia and Abkhazia to violate the genocide convention so the primary thrust of the judgment on the merits, if we can call it that on the merits, I'm not sure we can call it that, but of the final judgment, the primary thrust was that this dispute was really about the Convention for the Elimination of uh, All Forms of Racial Discrimination, or CERT. Here, Georgia runs into another roadblock, another problem. The CERT has a treaty requirement that says that nations must negotiate before they resort to a judicial forum to resolve the dispute, okay? That's right in the treaty. Georgia said, sure, we filed. We didn't exactly negotiate because we're shooting bullets and tanks and we're having this war with one another. So it would be futile because we are in a, in a conflict. The International Court of Justice, nevertheless, uh, found that the CERD did require executive branch negotiations as a condition precedent to filing suit in the International Court of Justice. The court found that regardless of statements that were made, uh, I think both at the UN and uh, by the president here in Georgia, uh, that the court lacked jurisdiction to proceed in Georgia's claim against Russia 
uh, and that's a whole other presentation, which others in the audience are far more exp uh, expert, have more expertise than I do. That's another discussion. But the point is, is that if the court had found it had jurisdiction to proceed, had this requisite evidence, then Georgia presumably would have had a great merit-based analysis uh, for the argument that Russia had violated the CERT Convention against all forms of racial discrimination uh, against ethnic Georgians as they were arguably being purged from uh, Ossetia and Abkhazia. So you have a dismissal on jurisdictional grounds, essentially, or a dismissal on grounds that, uh, uh, well, we, the court, don't have the power to go forward until the two countries have negotiated. It's as if the case, when this happens, it's as if the case had never been filed. Six of the 15 judges dissented, but as you know, the majority rules. Okay? If they had had their way, there would have been a full-blown discussion, and Georgia would have had its chance uh, to try to present its claim uh, in terms of uh, the violations of human rights that occurred in South Ossetia and Abkhazia. The second of two relevant International Court of Justice opinions is the Kosovo secession case. The ICJ had an extraordinary opportunity to provide guidance uh, regarding the law of secession. And I only have a few more minutes before I finish. The background was that Serbia convinced the UN General Assembly to seek an advisory opinion regarding the legitimacy of Kosovo's 2008 unilateral declaration of independence from Serbia. The ICJ, however, modified its, the question frame pursuant to the power that it had under its advisory jurisdiction power the question that the court answered instead was whether the declaration of a particular body, and that was the Kosovo Assembly, was a violation of, whether the declaration of independence by the Kosovo Assembly, essentially their parliament, was a violation of international law. The, this couldn't be a violation in that limited sense because Kosovo's parliament represents the people and could not have made that declaration without the acquiescence of the executive branch. Now, the, I remember seeing the pictures. Maybe you saw them too on page one of the Kosovo lawyers, winners in the Kosovo secession case. Okay. Nothing was really decided. The ICJ was careful not to make any pronouncements about the elements of the legitimacy of remedial secession, which is what Serbia wanted to establish to say that Kosovo had not shown that there was no other alternative but secession. And if I had the time, I'd love to go into that presentation, but that's another day, because I think Serbia has a pretty good argument there. Now, this all may sound preposterous to you, since the case is known as the Kosovo secession case. And the Western press reported Kosovo won. Okay? But here's the key passage, paragraph 51. And I hope you remember this for those of you international law students. Whenever the, have any of you studied the Kosovo secession case? Okay. So hopefully you studied paragraph 51, which says, and I quote, to show you the failure of the court to really resolve anything about what are the elements for legitimate secession. In paragraph 51, and I quote, the question asks for the court's opinion on whether or not the Kosovo Assembly Declaration of Independence is in accordance with international law. It does not ask about the legal consequences of that decision. In particular, it does not ask whether or not Kosovo has thus achieved statehood nor does it ask about the validity or legal effects of the recognition of Kosovo by those states which uh, have recognized as an independent state. Accordingly, the court does not have uh, consider it necessary to address whether or not that declaration led to the creation of a nation state that was legitimate or the status of the acts of recognition, close quote. So the ICJ dodged, International Court of Justice dodged the opportunity to clarify the law of remedial secession in a way that the Canadian Supreme Court had done, yielding three elements of uh, uh, legitimate secession uh, that are in your handout uh, went through a few moments ago. For the meaning of the Kosovo secession and other separatist movements, we are stuck with, I mean, have the benefit of the curious political exchange, and I won't go through it again, between Candy, uh, Condoleezza Rice, our Secretary of State, and her counterpart in Russia uh, about Kosovo is sui generis, and then the Russians saying, South Ossetia and Abkhazia, those are very unique. There's no precedent for other, uh, as we might expect from those countries. Uh, I think Ms. Rice was thinking that Russia was claiming Kosovo as a precedent uh, for the secession for South Ossetia and Abkhazia. Okay. Um, so the Notwithstanding the respective recognitions of 
Kosovo, South Ossetia, and Abkhazia by the US and Russia. Uh, none of those three unilateral secessions uh, uh, were, that they, none of those were precedent for any other breakaway province. The US and Russia thereby avoided, just like the International Court of Justice did, the US and Russia avoided any serious analysis of the legitimacy of these three 2008 secessions uh, uh, in terms of the requirements for legitimate unilateral secession. I'll now close with the formal part of my presentation, which comes from the G8, because when you study international law, you know that money talks. G8's response to Russia's intervention in Georgia was unmistakably direct, unlike the Russia-Georgia exchange that we talked about earlier today. And I quote, we condemned the G8, the action of our fellow G8 member, Russia's recognition of the independence of South Ossetia and Abkhazia violates the territorial integrity and sovereignty of Georgia. Russia's decision has called into question its commitment to peace and security in the Caucasus. Close quote. If you'll now turn to parts F and G of your handout, you will see two questions there. You've heard enough from me. It's a daunting task for an American to come to Tbilisi for court to tell you about the legitimacy of secession in your own backyard. But remember what I said in the beginning. In the beginning I said, there will be an examination at the end of the lecture. Turns out I wasn't joking. Now we're gonna see whether or not I was a good professor. We've now concluded my part of the presentation, so I wanna end it with two questions. The answers to which are necessary for a reasoned analysis of the legitimacy of South Caucasus secessions and future secessions by way of unilateral declarations of independence. Those two questions are question number one on your handout. Was South Ossetia and Abkhazia legitimate, are they legitimate states today under international law? Question number two, NK, legitimate states under international law? You can start with you. How would you approach that question, lawyers in the audience? I give a pass to journalists. How would you approach that question? Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you very much for a very insightful uh, presentation and actually a very uh, very interesting question, which directly is linked to one of my questions that I had. Um, so you're going to answer my question with a question? Um, uh, but go ahead. Yes, I'll, I'll, I would put this in, in, in this perspective. So now the audience. This is okay, good, and I hope that I'm going to hear answers from the audience because I've concluded my part of the presentation. So go ahead and ask away. Uh, remembering the context is whether South Ossetia and Abkhazia, which I think are probably foremost in everybody's mind are legitimate secessions and legitimate states today under international law. But go ahead. Yes. Um, so, uh, probably I will try to provide from what from uh, the, the, the answer or the, the vision from my perspective, but actually I'm sure everybody would uh, um, um, would like to ask you um, to have this, finally to have the Q&A. So uh, this question would also, the, that I'm going to pose, will also address you and what is your vision in this regard. May I and squeeze in one point before you ask your question? So it is yeah, interconnected. And sure, this sure, sure. Is the, let, uh, me squeeze in, let me squeeze in one point, which sure. is how would you approach answering that question about whether South Ossetia and Abkhazia are legitimate Thanks. states today? How would you approach it, lawyers in the audience? That, that's, a norm, that, that, that's a concept, whether we approach a normative concept of statehood or non-normative st um, concept of statehood. Yeah, we don't have a statute, we don't have a treaty on secession, so therefore we're allowed to, under Article 38 International Court of Justice, sources of international law, turn to national court decisions. Do we have a national court decision on point? Yeah, it's a Canadian secession case. That is the leading case in the world right now on the question of the three elements and those three elements. That's the framework that I was trying to get to. But no, no, please, uh, uh, though, it, it, is, it, it is very interesting that in, in Quebec case, the Supreme Court actually, it, the an enumeration of these three elements is not exhaustive because it says that, it's, the court said that at least these three elements. So there might be some other elements that we don't know and that can, can come into play. But the idea is whether any, um, uh, any entity is a state should be answered from the perspective of, 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 of um, what we understand as a statehood. This was, uh, this is my understanding and this was actually my question that I wanted to, to, to pose to you. So in the, um, in the modern uh, in concept of statehood, 
Do you consider this that this should be a normative concept, which means that we should stick to Montevideo Convention and uh, focus on these three and uh, on these four elements that are there, or there should be some? Can there be some other non-normative um, understanding of statehood, and um, could uh, other elements? not provided in, 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 in a convention, which is the legal source of, uh, under Article 38 um, of ICJ statute, um, can other, th other elements have a more important role in modern system of international relations um, than a normative approach? So I think each lawyer will, at least the lawyers that we are here, would answer from this or that perspective. My approach is a normative approach. So for me, um, as a lawyer, and not representing any institution, um, my understanding would be uh, that I still consider that even in the modern understanding of statehood should be based on normative concept. Though we also, I would like to hear your perspective in this. Two, two points. Number one is, let me take just a heartbeat to outline for those who are not lawyers in the audience and to refresh your recollections, I'm sure all the lawyers remember what the elements are of the Montevideo Convention. Point, question number two is, were you going to answer that question? Yeah. yeah. Okay, you watch just for a second. Let me very briefly go through Montevideo, okay? So there's a convention, a treaty that's often referred to uh, from Montevideo, uh, Uruguay, I'm not sure which Latin American country. So the Montevideo Convention says you have to have a uh, defined populace. That sounds a little bit like our people element, but it's not actually not the same. It's like a defined populace within the area that's claiming to be an independent state. That you have. Historically, historically, I'm sorry. Well, historically, this place. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the man with the the mic is next, so that we'll make sure that we get. So basically, a defined populace, a defined territory. The Gypsies, for example, don't have a defined territory. They're not claiming a nation state, okay? Uh, the uh, uh, ability to and engagement in international relations with other countries uh, is a formidable element. Uh, so that's kind of the background for the question that is now posing, is now posed to us. And I think the question, as I recall, and I'm trying to reframe the questions for the uh, camera, uh, uh, is whether there should be a normative approach to uh, answering the question of whether South Ossetia of Kazi are, are legitimate states or should there be something beyond normative uh, 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 to be a part of that equation. You said you had an answer, sir? Uh, yeah, partially. No, no. First of all, greetings and thanks for the speech and, and today's discussion. Uh, my, my personal opinion, obviously, I'm going to express my personal opinions here and I hope it's, you will find it interesting. Uh, the, the, I, I absolutely agree with Tico that it's very important to evaluate the situation from the normative perspective, and you look at the Montevideo Convention, and by looking at the Montevideo Connection, uh, Convention, you basically are going to analyze the result and assess whether the given entity has achieved the statehood, okay? Now, now but, but the problem with the Montevideo Convention is that it, it is not good enough, at least to, to, my, to my personal opinion, to assess the legality of the procedure, the whole set of processes that, led, that lead uh, to the creation of the statehood. And this is where we, we look at the, at, the, at the practice. And the case that you have brought up, the Quebec, Quebec <coughs> secession case that has been uh, decided by the Supreme uh, Court of Canada, is, is, is uh, basically the only one that has been known to the wider audience, right? And in this, in this case, the, the court actually uh, says that there are two types of self-determination. The one is the <coughs> internal one, and the second one is the external one. And uh, as far as I remember, the court does not even go into the depth of elaborating on the, on the external self-determination, because they say that uh, they they, they, they uh, uh, kind of remar remember uh, they go into uh, analyzing how can a right to internal self determination grow into the right of realizing external self determination and the difference between the two is that external self determination is the one that leads to the creation of the separate state whereas the internal self determination is basically a right of peoples and I'm not going to go into the definition of the peoples, to uh, realize their economic, political, social, and cultural rights. 
right? And the court, when, when, it, when it heard the case, they said that basically it was obvious if the Prime Minister of Canada was from Quebec, and, and there was no uh, ground to say that they were even deprived of right of internal self-determination. But, but the court also indirectly but assessed one very uh, important criteria that is very important to assess the legality of the creation of the new state. Uh, it was, it was uh, mentioned in the, um, uh, in the amicus brief, if I remember it correctly, and it was the effectivity rule. What is the effectivity rule? So it was an argument that even if you have people who, who are entitled to exercise the right of external self-determination, then for this entity, for the peoples to become a state, they have to satisfy this effectivity rule, which means that basically they have to become an effective state and not some, not some uh, bunch of chaotic people who uh, will not know how to manage themselves. That would be a bunch of rowdy Texans want to secede from the U.S. like Texas is claimed from the U.S. <laughs> yeah, yeah, one way to look at it. Uh, but but, but th this, is, this is a very, very important principle, at least to my perspective, because, uh, because this, is, this is what's happening now. Once the effectivity principle is in place, which means that once the international community acknowledges that now it's okay, they are not even looking at whether it was legal or not. If they accept the situation, now, th now that may become legal because it becomes effective. So that is what, what Russia may have been trying to do right now. They are very well aware that, that neither of those criteria were, were fulfilled, right? If we look at the, at the criteria set out by the, by the Canadian Supreme Court, or if we look at the scholarly works and etc. and etc., the classical definition is that one is entitled to the external self-determination only if it is a colonial domination, if there is foreign occupation, or if there is a, 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 there is impossibility to exercise internal self-determination is one of the criteria for being deprived of exercising internal self-determination is gross violation of human rights, right? So th the effectivity principle is what matters at this stage, in my personal opinion, because what has been done is done. The, the legal community has expressed to my point, very clear opinion that what has been done is in direct uh, contradiction to the international law. But now, for it to to turn into for it for, for the statehood of Abkhazia and South Ossetia to be, become legal, the only hypothetical way is for the effectivity principle to to be uh, to be in place and. I really want you to comment uh, on this last uh, kind of a principle of effectivity, which is a post-factum acknowledgement of, of an occurrence, right? Which may, which may create a, a, legitimate, uh, a legitimacy for, for the occurrence. I don't After believe it has yeah. happened. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. I don't believe that I have to comment because you did such a great job of working through the meaning of that particular principle and that gloss upon the Canadian Quebec case. What I would like to do is direct attention back to uh, the point uh, which I understood was should we have a normative approach or should other factors come into the equation? Uh, Mr. Fletcher raised a point earlier today in his question that resonated with me when he was concerned about, expressed some of the concerns at the time of the former Socialist Republics being admitted in the UN. I think his term was uh, expedient uh, determinations as opposed to maybe legal. I don't know if he used that, that particular precise phrase. But that resonated with me because it suggests uh, that uh, whenever you do a post hoc determination, like the US deciding that Kosovo was a country, then I guess that's what I think you're suggesting might be a non-normative uh, uh, decision by the United States to recognize Kosovo as an independent state, although 90 other countries have done so since. But that doesn't mean that all 91 got it right or not. It doesn't mean that the UN General Assembly got it right in, in admitting all those other states. But the point is, is that uh, it seems to me that no matter how you slice it with all the different elements that could come up, uh, your question goes to the heart of the matter, which is how should we determine today whether a particular secession 
Kosovo, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, and all the other ones that are coming, uh, presumably, uh, is legitimate or not. So one would hope that there would at least be a treaty on secession. Of course, we all know that will never happen. That's political suicide. So we would hope that statements by countries like the U.S. and Russia would help to uh, provide some precision as to kind of a, I guess, post facto in the sense that I've heard from the last uh, responder, uh, uh, way outside of Montevideo of recognizing the supposed legitimacy of a state, that, of an area that's declared independence. Uh, but there's problems with that as well. So it would seem that it would, if we could at least have a normative uh, uh, approach, which you know, on the one hand, and remember, remedial secession is an equitable remedy for the harshness of the bias against uh, unilateral secession from other states. But recalling that those secessions typically arise in the context of gross human rights violations, sometimes more minor violations like the Quebecers, okay, because that was pretty minor. I don't think Canada, the Canadian government was genociding French-speaking people. So, but, but the point is, is that the more that you have a norm, and rather than an either or, I think the more that you have a normative approach, and the clearer that states can effectuate, that we can come up with a way of articulating the standards for recognizing a secession of a, and, and get into the facts so that we can find out uh, 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 what the facts are in terms of whether there's gross human rights violations, which the International Court of Justice uh, wasn't able to do in the Georgia-Russia case, which the International Court of Justice in the Kosovo case turned its back on the perfect opportunity to address all of these issues in a very, very significant way by the World Court, which hopefully would have had a decision that dealt with the real question presented by Serbia, not the one that the court reconstructed through its advisory opinion uh, power. So I think essentially the bottom line is, I, I would agree with you uh, in the sense that I think you said having a normative approach would be certainly better than having an ad hoc approach where Georgia and Russia, for example, can say, oh, we think this is unique. Oh, we think that's different than all the others. It's not a secession. Maybe it would be better to have the State Departments get together to at least have an informal understanding, if not a formal, formal treaty understanding, of adopting or not adopting the various elements of the, for example, the Canadian secession case. Yes, sir. Um, in respect to the question, Wait a minute, if this is a hard question, if this is a hard question, if it's a hard question, I'll do the interview now. If it's not a hard question, I'll take your question. I'm not sure if I'm being pressured to end. So let me see. Uh, we have time, or how are we doing on time? I know we've gone over. What time is it now? Yeah. What time is it now, Neil? Do we know what Seven. Just... Seven. What is it? Seven. Seven. Uh, let me at least take your question. Uh, oh. Oh, that's fine, but I don't, that's fine, but the audience is here and has suffered, I mean, has enjoyed the last two hours. <laughs> I think we should give the audience the opportunity to ask any questions they have, and I'll be more than happy to uh, interview, preferably not in Georgia. Oh, you mean you have to, uh, uh, are they saying no interview if I deal with the audience? Yeah, so they're not in a rush. Let me take one more question then, uh, quick one, and I'll see what I can do to answer or not answer the question as best I can. Sir. The question is in respect to our South Ossetia and Abkhazian legitimate states. My question is legitimate for whom? Because, you know, the According to our, yours and my Declaration of Independence, governments derive their just powers from the consent of the government. And legitimacy, of go that's equivalent to legitimacy. So the question is, are we speaking about, are they legitimate for the people there, or are they legitimate for other people who may not in fact count? 
let me conclude with my uh, opinion. I usually try to avoid giving my personal opinions because I'm not important, but hopefully what we all have to say to each other is important. Uh, uh, my personal sense is that there's no way in the world that South Ossetia or Kosovo, I'm now a traitor, I may be fired from my position in First EDU, but there's no way that any of the three 2008 secessions uh, could possibly be legitimate specifically in response to South Ossetia and Abkhazia, the, the other alternatives weren't considered at all. There are a number, there's a half a dozen other alternatives that I worked my way through, and there are some more, but those are the major ones. None of those were attempted. You had a separatist conflict that, one could argue, had its genesis somewhere in between the United States announcing that Georgia uh, was going to go on fast track to go NATO, also greatly aided much more directly by the Russian intervention, coming into uh, earlier by passing out the, the, the um, uh, Russian passports, also by the military intervention, and we know there's undoubted military intervention by Russia, invited by the separatists. So when you engage in acts of war, and you ask a foreign power to come in to try to resolve a matter when it's very questionable whether, uh, as the separatists say, that Georgia had violated the human rights of Russians, which are like, what, 1% of uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia. I think that percentage has remained pretty constant throughout this whole time because of a large number of Georgians and other minorities there in those areas. Pretty hard to say that if you're gonna use a normative approach and international law allows resort to in the absence of treaty, customary practice of states, and when there's not clarity in the practice of states, evidenced by Condoleezza Rice and her Russian counterparts exchange, then you look to see whether there's some national decision, and as was pointed out by the gentleman a few moments ago, you have this one opinion, the one opinion that all the academics are referring to, and are being, and it's the one which says, "Hey, here's a normative approach that we can use, in the sense that these are the elements, and in order to have a uh, a, 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 a secession that is legitimate, uh, you have to go by these elements." I would hope that the day would come when that happens, and we can do that. But if, my, if our own International Court of Justice reframes the question posed by Serbia, turns its back on this perfect opportunity to globalize, if you will, the Canadian secession case, regardless of which way they held, but to come up with some elements, uh, that, would have gone a, that would have done wonders, I think, in terms of at least uh, uh, coming up with something you could point to in addition to one of the 200 nation states courts making a decision on, on this, the Kavik secession case. So I think when you have the International Court of Justice, when you have two major world powers who don't want to touch it, there's no treaty on secession, then all we can hope for uh, is to hopefully, you educate yourselves, I'll educate my students, you people in this audience are tomorrow's leaders, and it's possible that someone or some group among you, or maybe your various departments, uh, foreign ministry, will have a significant role now that you have a better sense of what this issue is, I think that's why you're here today, to maybe see what can be done uh, to try to get Georgia to stick with this issue and to try to see if there's a way in which they can come up with a, a normative approach. That's very difficult to do, admittedly, why? Because a treaty on secession never happened, political suicide. Uh, so thank you very much for being an excellent audience. I have run out of time because I want to do the interview now or never. Thank you so much, and I'll be around to chat with you privately in a few moments. And thank you very much for, uh, for uh, doing the great camera work.